Good evening. Good to see everyone here tonight. If everyone will, to go ahead and turn to number 194. Number 194. There's a land that is Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege we have to come here tonight, study another portion of thy word. Pray that you will be the teachers of the hour. Give them a happy recollection of those things they prepared. Pray as students, as participants, that we dismiss things from our mind and rightly divide that word. And pray we'll grow in knowledge, spirit, and truth and apply it to our everyday lives. Pray, Heavenly Father, you bless all who are new to prayer at this time, especially those who have been mentioned in announcements. Those who are sick, those who are bereaved, those who are shut in. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you grant us the wisdom and knowledge to do and say those things most needed to help them, and also say and do those things that cause them to help themselves if possible. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your love for us, for sending your only begotten Son to die on that cruel cross for our sins. Pray, Heavenly Father, be ever mindful of this and strive to live the Christian life every day. Pray we go this, on through this hour of study, watch over and protect us, guide us and direct us, if it be thy will. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Good evening. We welcome you this evening to our midweek Bible study at the Bremen Church of Christ. A good number assembled here. We're thankful for any visitors who are with us this evening. I invite you back. Anytime you can be here with us at Bremen for Bible study and worship. We'll dismiss to our classes now, the nursery preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. And the middle school and high school classes. Ah, yeah, fancy one. Put it on there and the extra wire you can put in the pocket. Oh, yeah. That's right. I'll take it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 
I don't want to give you a code. Okay, there you go. Okay. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay. We'll go with it. Right, so. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, very good. Well, I am thankful to have the opportunity to be uh, teaching once again. I'll put this over here. Now, tonight, uh, I want us to think about a topic that applies to each and every one of us as Christians. And that is the topic of developing ourselves spiritually. Developing spiritually. Now, we understand that to develop spiritually... Uh, we must do certain things to cultivate our own soul. You know how oftentimes uh, people are uh, they're baptized for the right reasons. They are faithful in their attendance. They uh, might even teach a class or two. And that's all very well and good. And that is what is uh, to happen to the Christian. However, it sometimes may occur that that person may actually not develop himself or herself spiritually. So how can we take care of our own souls? It's very, very important that we get to heaven. So how can we develop ourselves spiritually? You know, you think of oftentimes, how many times you hear of someone who uh, will invest lots of time, who will invest lots of money, uh, travel to different places to develop themselves, uh, educationally, they go off to universities or uh, go to technical colleges or whatever, and they try to develop themselves in an education manner. You'll see and hear of individuals who will spend lots of money to uh, develop themselves physically. You know, maybe getting healthier or losing weight or those kind of things. And so, oftentimes, uh, you don't hear of people who have taken the same amount of time and money to develop themselves spiritually. And that becomes a crisis in a person's soul when we fail to neglect our own soul's health. And sometimes it happens. Now, we know that uh, every one of us is going to reach God at some point in time. We understand that. We understand that every one of our souls is in an unavoidable uh, way into destiny. And we choose how we develop ourselves spiritually, whether we're going to go to heaven or hell. And also, we, uh, because people are religious by nature, we are all religious by nature, that the Bible has, given, has been given unto us to be a standard to teach us properly about how to grow ourselves spiritually. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction. And another word for that is discipline or teaching in righteousness that a man of God may be perfect. So that friend never get work. Now perfect there can also be complete. Going into a form of completeness. Going into a form of... Uh, fully fruit-bearing. You have matured enough to be benefited and to benefit others. Now, uh, I like this verse. And I actually have around three different texts I'm going to use. But Romans 8, verse number 6, says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Romans 8, verse number 6. And so we must study the Bible Daily. Romans 10, 17. So faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so that's where our standard is to be. And the more we commit to the word of God, and the more we strive to develop our faith and make our spiritual lives deeper, hand in hand with God, then our lives will be better. Because we are putting our faith where it ought to be, 
and not in uh, material things, you see. Now, uh, faith, we understand, is vitally important to our spiritual life. John 20, 30 and 31. Uh, we need to study it. We need to study the Bible, read it, and memorize it. And Psalm 119, verse 11 says, For thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against you. And so we need to memorize it. And so true faith means that you would take God and Christ seriously. Hebrews 9, 27, where it says, that After this a judgment, and that judgment is for every man. Now, uh, the question is, is what are we doing today to prepare our souls, to cultivate our souls, to develop spiritually? Now, uh, go, if someone wants, and now I want to start calling people to start reading. That was just kind of an introduction there. Uh, somebody go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter number 5. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. If someone wants to read that for us, it would be very, very helpful. Go ahead, Bob. But solid food is for full-grown men, even those by reason who have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. I think you want me to go back, don't you? Are you in verse 12? 12. Oh, there you go. Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. I apologize. No problem. But when by reason of the time you ought to be teachers, you have need again that someone teach you the rudiment, rudiments of the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of solid food. Okay, and 13 and 14, please. Once, once, For everyone yep. that partakes of milk is without experience of the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food is for the full-grown men, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. Okay. Now, from Hebrews 5, 12 to 14, uh, what can we see there about the necessity of developing ourselves spiritually? What are some things we see from this particular passage? God doesn't want us to stay a baby. God doesn't want us to become an infant or stay as an infant. Yep, or a baby. Spiritual, Spiritual baby, yep. It's just natural to have teachers in the church. And yes. if we don't have teachers in the church... There's a serious problem. Yep. Forms us mature as Christians. Right. And what's a sign of maturity? Being able to discern good from evil, righteousness from unrighteousness. Mm-hmm. And that's and every one of these points is entirely valid, and that's that's what I was really looking for. Uh, you can't have one of that other kind of thing. So that, that's the point I was looking for. To develop spiritual means that you can understand uh, moral issues better because now you have a spiritual guideline through the Bible. You can understand uh, wisdom more because now you have the Bible as your guide. You have God directing you also through His Word so that you can discern good and evil because who decides what's good and what's evil? Well, man tries to, but man doesn't do very good at that. So God, the one who is holy, is the one who describes and defines good and evil. So we can properly discern based upon what God has already told us what is good and evil. Yes? Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, there's a word that, that really should draw our attention to it. It's the word ought. Okay. You know, when I say to my children what you ought to have done, it means that there is a standard that they came short of. Sure. And here it says, for at the time that you ought to be teachers, God has set a standard and says, as a Christian, you will develop into a teacher. Now, at the point that individuals do not do that, then they miss the standard. Sure. That's a good point. Because the whole context of the book of Hebrews is all about developing spiritually. It's all about a Hebrew... Christians, I guess, if you want to use that phraseology. Uh, they were the ones who were uh, threatening the idea of going into apostasy. They're the ones who are saying we should go back to the law of Moses, we should leave the law of Christ, and go back into 
uh, Old Testament times, and yet Hebrews 5, well, really the whole, the whole book of Hebrews is dealing with, but Hebrews 5 and 6 talk about the impossibility of getting into heaven, or what's the possibility that's with you being apostate, that's with you neglecting and then denouncing Christianity. Uh, so that's all a warning, really. And, and that's, that's exactly right. That goes along with the general theme of the book of Hebrews. It's all a big warning saying you need to be at this point. Uh, Hebrews 6 uh, says to go on to perfection. That's go on to a full mind of completeness, go on to a full mind of, of maturity. Uh, that's a good point. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now, I've never done this in a class before, so I have no idea how long, how long it's going to take for nothing. And I feel like I'm very, very loud and very, very fast. Am I fast? Can everyone understand me? I feel like I'm being extremely quick. Okay. Maybe it's just me in my own head. Who knows? Anyhow. Okay. So, let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 5 now. Good comments. And verse number 3. And this is all talking about uh, developing ourselves spiritually again. And to know how to develop, we have to know where we came from. So Matthew 5, verse 3. Someone doesn't mind reading that. Very, very helpful. All right. Thank you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you look at Matthew 5, verses 3 and following, down verse number 9, this has been called the building blocks to the one who would enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so before one enters into the kingdom of heaven, they must go through these particular uh, steps. Number one, they must understand their own spiritual poverty. And that's by sin, you know. Sin... Uh, spiritual weaknesses around all cause someone to be poor in spirit. And that poor there is talking about uh, poverty. It's talking about how they long for something else. They long to get somewhere and that's in their spirit. That's their heart. Okay, They want something, but they're poor. And so they're realizing that and they're realizing their own inability to, to save themselves. And therefore, man sees his sinful condition without the help of the Lord. And the person poor in spirit realizes the need for God to bring in salvation because of our trust in God. And the trust in God means that we obey God. And we obey God because of what He says. Now, the most important thing in our life is the day that we realize that we need God. Uh, someone go to Luke chapter 18 now, Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. And in this particular passage, we have two individuals. One is proud and one is not proud. Uh, but go to Luke 18, 9 to 14. Somebody read that for us. I'm going to see what God respects in a person. Luke 18, 9 to 14. All right, thank you. Now, from this particular passage, uh, it's very interesting that to be uh, a spiritually developed person does not mean that we are comparing ourselves spiritually to others, number one. Uh, because somebody else might seem to be more spiritual does not mean that we have to be like them. This is our own personal decision to be spiritually minded. And so, it's our, same thing as our own soul, going into heaven or going into hell. That's our own decision. Uh, we cannot base that upon somebody else. This has our own spirituality. 
What are some other things though, that you see from this particular passage? Go ahead. It's opposite from the world. If you're in business or you're in education, you know, the dominant view is you build yourself up, get your papers, get your degrees, and you'll really be somebody. You must protect your career. And after a while, with enough time, with enough papers written, with enough degrees, you'll be able to be exalted in the echelon of higher bureaucratic educational things. Yeah. But the opposite is that's actually true. Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. Now, the same is true in a lot of businesses, too. So it's opposite than the way the world operates. We need to be mindful of that. Sure. Sure. And there are a few more verses I'm going to bring you up about that, too, uh, as we go through. What else? That's a good point. What else? From this particular passage, do we see um, about developing ourselves spiritually? Like, what is God not impressed with? Let's put it that way. From this passage, what is God not impressed with? Self-righteousness. Self-righteousness? Americans. Americans. Arrogance. Arrogance. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad you clarified that. I was getting kind of offended up here. Uh, okay, I'm wearing a shirt, you know. Uh, somebody back there, somebody said something? Or was it you? Uh, arrogance, not not Americans. Um, Grandpa? What? I thought you said something. Well, uh, you might as well look at pride. The first. Right. Sure. And um, now, going along with this, I've always thought about um, the two cases of um, the nobleman, Second Kings five about Naaman, and the centurion of um, I think Luke eight about how you see the two different uh, mindsets as they approach God. Second Kings five about Naaman, he came up and he had leprosy, and he came up to uh, the house of Elisha. And uh, you know, he told Elisha to come out now. I need you to heal me of my leprosy. I need it now. And Elisha just sent out, out his servant, you know, and saying, "You uh, go dip seven times south of the Jordan, and you'll be healed." And uh, but you think of the arrogancy as it came up to the house. And then you look at Luke eight, I believe it is, where you see uh, how that one centurion had uh, sent his friends, and then the Jewish rulers came, and then. Uh, his servant came asking for uh, his, the centurion servant to be healed. And then Christ said, I have not found such great faith, no, not even in Israel. Because you see uh, how they might be the similar, but yet it has a different heart there. And so um, I think it's kind of similar here. These two individuals, are not, one is not greater than the other. And in the great scheme of things, one is the same as the other one. But it's all depending on how they approach God. Remember how this guy said, I think, my God, that I'm greater than this person? What's he doing? He's comparing himself to somebody else. You know, we do that all the time. You know, inside of the church, speaking to say, I wish I was like so and so. You know, well, that's great. And I do that too. But we shouldn't be doing that because it's all about us growing ourselves spiritually. We shouldn't be worrying about others uh, to that degree, anyways, about comparing ourselves, you know should compare ourselves to the Word of God and how our faith should go in Christ. That's where we should kind of go at it from there. But then it's the other man who came out and he had the attitude of, I'm a sinner, I need your help. That's poor in spirit. He sees his inability to do anything for himself. He needs God. Okay? So God's not impressed with um, arrogancy or pride or nothing like that. Okay? And so... Uh, God wants us to take our sins seriously and to realize our need for His mercy and grace. All right. Uh, let's see. Matthew 5, verse number 4 now. 
And this is going to go into another area of uh, our own spiritual development. Matthew 5, verse number 4. Somebody have that? Okay. Now, what are they mourning over? Are they mourning over someone who's sick or is in the hospital? Sin? Yep. Yep. All right. Sure. All right. So sin. Sin, sin. Yep. That's exactly right. Uh, Psalm 51, verse number 17 now. Good comments. Psalm 51, 17. Somebody want to read that for us? be very, very helpful. And actually, I'm going to get into what you were talking about in a minute too, uh, Tim. Just a few more minutes, so. But uh, Psalm 51, verse number 17. Someone have that? A broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, will you not despise. Alright, so this is not talking about mourning over a lost loved one, but mourning over sin. And a person who has godly sorrow will repent of his sin. 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and 10. So how we uh, deal with our sins reveals how we deal with God. Uh, if we want to hide away our sins and if we want to hide away our own uh, lack of development spiritually, then that might also determine our own heart going toward uh, how we deal with God. Are we going to be open with God or are we going to be closed to God? That's kind of what I'm saying here. And so determining how open we are about dealing with this in our own lives will determine about how we can uh, move forward, how we can uh, go and press on toward the mark and go on and, and grow in our faith because we understand that we need God's mercy. We need God's grace and He's given it to us. But are we willing to accept it? Are we willing to uh, really strive to constantly, uh, I guess, live in it in a sense? Uh, and so uh, people who never think of God, never think about their how uh, offensive their sins are to God. James 4, 7 to 10. Now, uh, God gave us guilt not to, uh, to prick our hearts, not to punish us. Okay? So God gave us guilt to prick our hearts, not to punish us. Guilt is to empower us to make change, Hopefully. God gave us physical pain to tell us of danger. And God gave us spiritual pain for the same reason, to tell us we need to change something. And so guilt motivates our hearts and our souls to take the appropriate action. I think of Acts 2 about how they were pricking their hearts. You know what happened? They obeyed the gospel. Well, the guilt motivated them. They knew that they saw something that needed to be changed. And so they made appropriate actions in that uh, great time. Now, uh, it moves us to draw near to God and to resist sin. Uh, if we don't resist sin, we will have our hearts become calloused. I think of Isaiah 5.20, about how Isaiah is saying that uh, there are some who are called good, bad, and bad, good. What's happening? They're muddying the waters. You know how often, even inside of today's society, like I mentioned a moment ago, uh, do you see these things out in the open 
and you know it's sinful, but yet uh, culture and the world is calling it good. Well, they're, they're making sin into uh, nothing more than just that's your thing, that's my thing. Now it's all relative, you see. However, the Bible is not relative. The Bible is always absolute. And so uh, we need to understand that, that sin, if we allow sin to penetrate our hearts enough, we will, we will develop callousness toward uh, our own spiritual condition and toward sin. And the callous heart won't care who he hurts or, or how he hurts him. You know, that's why you have all of these people inside of these prisons uh, all across the world. And you see that they have that look in their eyes or, and, they just, and, they've, and then you hear their history about how they've killed 20-something people. You know, well, where, where have they, you know, what happened? Well, they've been cast. Now they just went rampant. But how often do you think of that in a, in a spiritual sense? About how often times someone may um, live in the world, but yet John 18 and 36 says we're not of the world, you know. But how often we let someone live in the world, but, and yet that influence begins to take a hold on them, and then they become callous toward their condition spiritually. And so we always need to have uh, in the front of our minds our own spiritual development because of these things. And there is hope for the person, for the one who feels guilt. There's always hope. The person who mourns over his sin will long to do what is right. And so, Matthew 5, verse number 6, goes along with this. Somebody want to read that for us. Matthew 5, verse number 6. Okay. So, what do we see here? What is this verse teaching us? Have an appetite for righteousness? Have an appetite for righteousness? Yep. Anything else? Well, it's, well, Bob, first and Tim. Hmm? It's, it's not a, we're not entitled to. It must be something we see diligently. <clears throat> right. Hebrews 11, 6. That's good. Tim? As we go to the Bible to seek fulfillment spiritually, we will never come away hungry. Okay. Yep. yep. Go ahead. There's an article in this week's bulletin that just came out today. We are just talking about how you label sin soft pedal it so that it seems a little bit easier, maybe not as bad as it appears, or mm -hmm. maybe a different way to look at it, things like pro-choice versus uh, baby murder, alternative lifestyle, cohabitating, life partners, no-fault divorce, rather than sodomite, fornicator, home record, things of that sort. So there's an article in this week's bulletin that addresses Okay, so get your bulletin and read it. Yep, very good. Uh, that's one thing that Bremen does very, very well, is that you always have a good bulletin. Yep. Uh, so read your bulletin for further comments. And I do like that's a good point about how you do try to um, change the meaning of things, you know, like alternative lifestyle. You know, well, it's not sin anymore, now it's an alternative lifestyle. You know, now I, I can now agree with you on that basis, you know. Or uh, equality, or you know, it's like. anyhow, good point. Good point. Uh, so, hungering means appetite. Uh, what was yours again? Me. Yeah. You, did you have one? Sure. Uh, you, you will be you filled. Be filled. That was yours. Yep. The, the Bible has enough information to leave us full after we go to that source. Okay, I, I knew you said something. I couldn't remember what it was. That's it. Be able to feel appetite. And yours was, I'm totally lost every comment for the past five minutes. You have to be diligent. Be diligent. That's right. Okay, I'm getting old. Uh, I apologize. I was, I was going to try to keep everyone together, you know, and I just, I just lost it. Okay, so uh, hungering is a necessity. Okay, for someone to grow, they have to eat. 
You can't put a baby out in the middle of nowhere and then not give them nothing. <laughs> you know, well, they, they die, you know. It might last for a little while, but it won't be very, very long because they need the constant nutrition. They have the appetite. Um, I think of Matthew 4.4, 4, about how we uh, hunger after the Word of God. We're hungering after this. We're hungering after righteousness. And, and what is righteousness? Right doing. We're hungering after right doing, and who tells us what, what right doing is? God. Okay, so hungering after what God wants us to do. All right? Which is always right. Now, you know, the prodigal son longed to be fed, Luke 15, 16. He longed for uh, proper nourishment. How often have you really yearned for proper nourishment? Now, has it been this week? Has it been this year even? But we all, as active and productive and growing Christians, ought to yearn and desire our own spiritual appetite. Call those weapons if you don't eat very much. You become very, very hungry, and then you have a lot of problems. And uh, it's very interesting in all the problems that you get from not eating. You know, you, there's a lot of different things, but... It happens a lot, even inside of Christianity, inside of our own spiritual souls. Uh, you know, if you don't eat, you begin to let things pass through, and you'll not be as able to discern good and evil. Uh, Hebrews five fourteen. Now, uh, the poor man Lazarus longed for the crumbs of the rich man's table. We need to have the same longing for the Word of God. People want to be forgiven. They want to have the grace of God, and that's necessary, of course. Living the holy life and remaining free from worldly lust is not a trivial thing to God. Living a holy life is not wrong, quite simply. Go to 2 Corinthians now, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 to 18. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 to 18. And this tells us something very, very important. But what is it? Second Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. Someone to read that for us? All right, so come out from among them. Uh, some versions say, uh, do not be fashioned with them. Do not go into the same uh, lump, I guess. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, and the ASV says, uh, be not deceived. What? That's questions 5, 4, you guys mock, that's a good one. Uh, 6, 7 is what you... Uh, be not deceived, evil companionships, corrupt good morals. Okay, but that's definitely a good one, though. Uh, so we must not constantly put ourselves in these kind of influences. Now, obviously, inside of the world, you have to, because that's what we all do. You know, we can't... Uh, go and be hermits and be out in the mountain somewhere and not talk to nobody. You know, you can't do that. But the question is, is what is your response to the world's attitude? You know, are you striving to live holy? And holy, I mean, uh, consecrated, set apart for God's service, that's holy. Or are we living unholy, you know? Uh, we shouldn't be living unholy, but uh, we need to be... I like... They ask me about that, about says um, evil companionships. Now, who are you closest to in, in, uh, with things? Now, who do you discuss spiritual matters with more? Who do you uh, associate with more? You know, if someone's not making you grow spiritually, um, you know, maybe you should take the appropriate action sometimes. But, um, you know, what are things are we doing in general to develop ourselves spiritually? What are we doing? Today in my life and your life, what are we doing? And so we need to uh, separate ourselves from entangling ourselves with these worldly lusts. 
1 John 2, 15-17. Uh, must be separate from the world. The grace of God is a very precious gift, but God has forgiven us for a reason. God has forgiven us so that we can change our lives. 1 Peter chapter number 1 now. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16. What time is class over? 10 till. 10 till. All right. Thank you. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16. And somebody else, while well, that's being found, go to Romans 12, verse 2. Romans 12, verse 2. So, someone has 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16. Can you please read it? All right, I think it's from Leviticus 11.44 there, verse 16. Be ye holy, for I am holy. So that's where our standard is, is found in God. Now, uh, Romans 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, All right, thank you. Now, uh, hungering for right doing, hungering for righteousness, changes our thinkings and our values. You know, I was, uh, whenever I was over in New Zealand, I had to do a whole camp on, uh, on the Christian character. You know, and what are the four things you can tell by somebody's character? What they spend the money on? who they spend the time with, uh, what they dress like, and where they go. You can tell that by their... You know, all these things will demonstrate somebody's character, how much pride they take of themselves, how much pride they take in other things, you see. Uh, so to be mindful of our Christian character and values, we need to understand uh, all these different things. Where are you putting your money in? and for what reasons, for how long, and, you know, and, and do these kind of things. And all of these things will demonstrate and will allow us, if we understand these properly, from a spiritual standpoint, all these things will allow us to develop our Christian character. And moving our Christian character values forward, like God has told us to do, because you know, Christianity is not stagnant, it's not stale, it's not uh, displaced, it's not... Uh, no, not moving. It's always growing. But it's not, uh, it's not ever going to stay still if we're practicing proper Christianity, which we all strive to do. And so we need to hunger after these things and make appropriate changes in our lives and our thinking and our values that go along with, that conform to God's will because His way are good and acceptable and perfect. And so, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21-22, I'll read that. It says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearances of evil. Now, there are different types of atheist. There is one type of atheist who says that he or she flat out does not believe in God at all. One type of atheist. And then you have what would be called a practical atheist. And that is an atheist who will uh, put on a front and they'll say all the right things, they'll be in the right places, they'll do everything just right, but yet behind closed doors, now their whole character changes. Okay, that's a practical atheist. That's the one who um, is not necessarily wanting to please God at any point in time. And that's one who is trying to uh, forget that God's always watching. Proverbs 15, verse number 3. God sees everything that we do. And secret sin is practical atheism. So hungering for righteousness 
will do what is right when people and God are both present at all times. That soft determines our character. Okay. Now, last point, and I'll try to finish. Uh, well, actually, I have two more points. Anyhow, uh, we need to focus on God more. Colossians 3, 1 to 4. If you focus on God more, you're going to have uh, your mind naturally developed spiritually. All right? So we must not let our distractions overcome us and think of God and what's prepared for us for heaven. Uh, we must choose carefully about what we think about. Philippians 4, verse number 8. If we want to transform our lives, then we must think godly thoughts daily. All right? Last point. We also need to... Uh, actually, I have two more points. I can't read. We need to cultivate an attitude of thankfulness. Uh, oftentimes, you see people who are, who are uh, not grateful for anything, and even inside of a spiritual condition, not very grateful for what God's done. And so they leave their first love. That's the gospel, that's the church, that's Christ, that's God. They leave their first love, and they go off and following after the world, you see. And so, we need to cultivate thankfulness. Psalm 100, verse number 4. Thinking, and by the way, thankfulness can also be, it's taken from, sorry, thankfulness is taken from the word thankfulness. So how I think. Thinking of all of God's goodness draws us, draws forth our gratitude. Okay? A thankful heart is a cheerful heart. And we'll be ready to thank God always. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18. The test of a Christian, the test of a Christian is when he gives thanks to God when life is harsh. James 1, 17 says, Thankfulness puts the focus on the goodness of God. People who spend their days counting the blessings and being thankful will not have time to remember the bad things happening. Thankfulness is our response to God's grace. And in fact, the word grace in the Greek language is the same word as being thanks. And so whenever you say your prayers at the table, you know, you say grace, you say your thanks. Okay, it's the same, same word there. Um, grace, God's grace encompasses more than forgiveness. It's all that God does for us. Being thankful for God's grace motivates us to have deeper faith, love, and service to God. 1 John 4, 19. And when we have the blessing of God, we will be rejoicing. Acts 8, 39. About the Ethiopian eunuch who was baptized, he went away rejoicing because now he found God's goodness you know, and salvation. Uh, last point. No spiritual life is complete without prayer. All right. No spiritual life is complete without a proper prayer life. God speaks to us through the Bible, but we talk back to God in our prayer. How often have you prayed? How frequent do you pray? I think, uh, and you can look at this in different points inside of the Scripture about Daniel 6.10, about how Daniel prayed three times a day. The Psalms says that David prayed seven times a day. But how often, how frequent are we praying? You know, I think we need to make, a, and I like uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, about prayer without ceasing. That means uh, to have a constant attitude of reverence, have a constant attitude of, of uh, thanking God. You know, how often are we praying? We understand that uh, God gives us every good gift, James 1, 17 again, and being a child of God means that you have a spiritual family at, at the church, and getting involved with the family of God at church is very, very important. Christianity is a journey of life. It's not it's a one-stop deal. It's a journey throughout all life, even into eternity. We must grow spiritually with each other, and the Lord himself adds people to the church and to that family when they were baptized, Acts 2.47, which takes place uh, whenever they were baptized, Acts 2, 38 and 41. Okay, that's my class. I'm a little bit over, but sorry about that. But I uh, hope that it was beneficial to you and that it may have um, helped you at least in some way motivate each one of us to grow and develop ourselves spiritually.
right, thank you very much for your time and your attention and your comments. I appreciate it very, very much. Do I press it? Teach me your wise one. Very good. There you go. Do I press it? Yeah. Those on our prayer list, Mike Johnson, this is Robert Edwards' brother-in-law, Carol's husband. He tells me he was in an automobile accident this evening and has been taken to the emergency room, but we don't have any update on him at this time. So certainly we should remember Robert's brother-in-law and his sister. Freddie Gray is scheduled to have hip replacement surgery. Nope, it's been postponed. Is that right? Postponed. She has a bronchitis-like infection. Hopefully it'll be done sometime next week, but she's got to overcome that first. Joyce Lambert, the mother of Mary Blank, had cataract surgery Monday. Is she doing okay? Doing okay, good. Jackie Tomlin, the mother of Kyle and daughter-in-law to Jim and Elise, was able to come home from the hospital and doing better. We're proud to report. We express our sympathy to the family of Shirley Smallwood, in the passing of her brother, Mr. Buell White, who died yesterday. High Tower Funeral Home has the arrangements. The visitation will be this coming Sunday, February the 8th, at 1 o'clock at the chapel at High Tower. The funeral will be this coming Sunday at 2 o'clock, February the 8th, at High Tower in Bremen. Services for Mr. Buell White. Visitation Sunday, February 8th, at 1 o'clock. Funeral at 2 o'clock, all at High Tower Chapel in Bremen. There's no, there's no request for food for the family at this time. No request for food. Are there others that we should mention? Ladies Devo will be tomorrow, 11 o'clock here at the building, a.m. The Children's Home Food Truck will be here March the 2nd. Please see the bulletin and the bulletin board for items needed. The Good Samaritans will go shopping for the Children's Home Food Truck 
March the 1st, which is the day before. Obviously, if you'd like to give your cash donation to Eric or Mary, they would be willing to receive it. Brothers Keepers Group 4, Chad and Reagan's group will meet Sunday, February the 15th after the evening service, Fellowship Hall, Finger Foods of the Fair. Group 2, which is Gary and Jamie's group, meets Saturday the 21st in the Fellowship Hall. The Bowden Winter Lectureship begins day after tomorrow, which is Friday, February the 6th. It goes through Sunday, and the topics and speakers are on the bulletin board here in the hallway. Yes, weekend is in Valdosta, February 20th through 22nd. Hopefully you've already signed up for that. Also, speaking of signing up, the Standing in the Gap Men's Meeting and Retreat in Lake City, Florida will be upcoming Saturday, March the 7th. We'll leave Friday, March the 6th, spend one night out. There's a sign-up list in the foyer for those that wish to go. We'll need to tell them in a couple of weeks how many are going, so sign that list at your earliest convenience. Brother Johnny. One other announcement very quickly. There is a, another area-wide, Metro Atlanta area-wide Devo at the Avondale Congregation this Sunday. They're going to start the devotional at 3.30 and then have the uh, devotional and then the eating and then their evening worship. So uh, we would be, you would be returning after evening worship. Um, I will not be able to, because of scheduling Sunday, I will not be able to go where I have to go Sunday and get back here at 3.30 and then go to Avondale. So if anybody wants to go, you can go. And if anybody would be willing to drive, then see me after, and uh, maybe we can have a group there uh, at the Avondale. They've asked me to come and lead singing for that. So uh, we will be uh, leaving from another location. Um, so see me after, and uh, it'll be a, a, good, a good day with our friends at Avondale. A um, couple of stories, one from Scripture and one that I heard today kind of uh, spoke to me with regard to uh, how much we need God. Uh, one of them is in John chapter 5, and this is a great story of Jesus and is told actually in the context of um, the, the, the Pharisees uh, con uh, condemning Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. But what a great story. And in John 5, beginning in verse 1, it says, There was a feast of the Jews. Now there was a, in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool which was called Beth Bethesda, having five porches. In these uh, lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the water to move. For, the Bible says, an angel went down at a certain time into the pool that they were laying around and stirred up the water. Then, whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water, the Bible says, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, a certain man who was there had had an infirmity for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew he already had been in that condition for a long time, he asked him this very uh, seemingly obvious uh, question, the answer to which should have been obvious, but it's still a very profound question. He says, do you want to be made well? Um, and the sick man answered Jesus and said, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but when I'm coming, another steps down before me. What a, what a sad, poignant situation this man found himself in, laying there, having been crippled, uh, unable to get up and move on his own, in a condition that he had had for 38 years, and seeing person after person when the water was stirred, step down into that pool and be made well. And Jesus comes and asks him this question, do you want to be made well? Some of the, the words that come to mind when I think of this man are that he needed, he needed great compassion and that he was very helpless. And uh, I, I think about that story, and, and again, it's very poignant. And it has a happy ending, of course. Jesus says, take up your bed and walk. And at that moment, he was immediately made well. And that's a great story that a, someone so helpless with the help of Christ became someone uh, who could, could, could live on their own and live the right kind of life. And then a, another story that I, I heard today uh, has to do with uh, a man over in South Korea. And of course, that, even though they're a, 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 a society that is in better shape than North Korea, 
there's still a great deal of poverty over there and it's a difficult place to live and sometimes people have children and they can't support them and the story said that in South Korea it's very common for people to take their newborn children and abandon them on the street so this particular man started what basically is an orphanage for these children who would be otherwise abandoned on the street and the thing that was unique about this is that he he to to insulate I guess the person who needed to give up their child from the embarrassment of that and the stigma surrounding that he put in basically a drop box for infants and there's a, bu a, a bell to ring and then you could hear the door thump closed and it, it actually vid there was a video of this man running down the stairs to collect the next child that had been left uh, and I thought about the helplessness of a child, an infant left on the street. That's got to be one of the most helpless pictures that we can imagine. Yet this man put his time and effort and energy into making a way for that child not to be left in that helpless situation. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love to us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's, that's how God sees us when we reach an accountable age and we commit sin. He sees us as a helpless, um, lost infant lying there on the street, unable to help ourselves. And we can't help ourselves. We must have Christ's help. But we do have the opportunity for that help. And just a few pages over in Romans 8, and the great end to that great uplifting chapter, in verse 37, Paul writes, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. God's love and help takes us from being a, a crippled person who can't make it to the pool when the water stirred, or a helpless infant lying on the street, and makes us conquerors. And he does that through his son. If you have not taken advantage of that help to become a Christian, to, have, uh, to be robed in white, to be seen by God as perfect because of the perfection that we enjoy through Christ, then that's something that you should very, very closely consider. If you strayed away from that and you don't have that help anymore, then we, we again make ourselves helpless. If you need the help of Christ, then do it as we stand and sing at this time. and song tonight will be number 420 420 we'll sing the first verse whatever you do in word or deed do all in the name of the Lord do not in name of man or greed do all in the name of the Lord do all
Let's bow. To God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that we've had tonight to come together as brothers and sisters and consider your word. We pray that uh, you will be with us every day in our lives and bless us and help us and help us to live good lives before our fellow man. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for sending Jesus Christ to the cross for our sins. We pray that you'll go with us now through the remainder of this service and on through further life. Christ, name we pray. Amen.